Welcome back to another great edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Christopher Brown. I'm your host, Chris Brown, and today we are talking about a great organization in upstate New York, the Bunbury Players. And to do that, we are bringing on Garrett West, the artistic director of Bunbury Players and the newly minted uh, interim executive director, our entertainment pundit, so our show uh, listeners and viewers will know this voice, Michael Nichols-Pate. Michael, Garrett, thank you so much for doing this. Absolutely. Okay, I was going to say, if you guys don't talk during this, it's going to be a very short interview. So let's talk about this great well, organization because I, I, I've i done my research and I, I try not to do research on this show as anyone can attest to that because I try to learn about the subject matter from the people who are on this show. But I wanted to do a little bit of research because I want to know who, who you were. But I'm going to get it from you, and we'll start with the artistic director here, Garrett West. <laughs> Actually, I'll, I'll open it up to the floor. Whoever wants to answer this, but I'm going to see. I'm going to point out Garrett for this. Um, who is? Who are the Bunbury players? Uh, do you want the hard answer? The, the easy? No. Um, Whatever answer you want to give, you want to give the simplistic answer, go right ahead. If you want to give the in-depth answer, that's the one I'm looking for. Give us the in-depth, baby. Well, let's start Let's start simply and we'll go from there. Uh, we're a bunch of knuckleheads who uh, couldn't help ourselves and wanted to do theater during a pandemic. <laughs> um, more in-depth wise, um, we're a bunch of friends who care about each other and have met many different ways. And during the pandemic, we found there was a lot of, well, lot, lot less theater, obviously. Most theater shut down, most, you know, performing arts shut down and we needed to express ourselves some way. So we started doing some Zoom production and it's led to doing full scale in-person productions that are both free and accessible to the public. Now, I, I want to pick up on that for a second before we move off to Michael here, because I, I find it interesting that you say that uh, you were just looking for an outlet. Why is it important to have theater as an outlet, especially during these hard pandemic times that we saw people not being able to creatively uh, express their artistic side through theater, through uh, live performances? Why was it important for you guys to come together to uh, create a organization like the Bunbury Players and find the, uh, and set up an organization like that? Theater is in our blood, so it's kind of second instinct for us to do theater. Um, it's many of us, some of it's our livelihood, some of it's a hobby, but either way, theater was something that needed to happen, not just for us, but we also thought the public needed it. They needed to have a little bit of escapism from the, the terrible times that were going on. Now, Michael, what about yourself? Who are the Bunbury players to you? So, I mean, many of the listeners to this podcast, like you said, will recognize my voice, know who I am. Um, to me, uh, Bunbury is an organization that was started by uh, probably my oldest friend I've had. I've known Garrett for, he's 28, 28 years. Uh, <laughs> so... To me, it's, it's a really important organization. I also grew up doing theater and it was an opportunity to not only be back involved in theater after a long period of time away, but to sort of work with a mission statement that I'm really passionate about. Um, many people who listen to the show or who may know a bit about me know that I am a social worker. So I'm always kind of looking for a mission statement that really speaks to what I do with my background. And I think for me, Bunbury's mission of free and accessible theater for not only those involved, but those coming to see, you can come to our show, not have a dollar to your name and come in and escape to see a production um, of ours. And I think that that's super crucial, especially in the rise of ticket prices uh, I know this is something that I've been speaking about quite a bit more locally with friends, but 
the rising cost of community theater is, is becoming pretty atrocious. Uh, we recently saw a production up here where it was $45 for like nosebleeds in a community theater production, not like a professional, nothing professional, just community theater selling a $45 ticket to the public. And then some programs even have a, a um, like an admissions fee of if you're going to be in the show, you have to pay $200, $300 just to be a part of the production. I mean, I think that the mission of Bunbury, of trying to keep free accessible theater that still has a good quality to it, that's so important right now. And especially like Garrett was saying, with the unprecedented times that we're in with this pandemic, it's so, so, so crucial that we have an outlet for creativity, whether that's seeing it or being a part of it, either on stage or behind the scenes. Now, we, we now know who you are, but I want to learn a little bit about the history of the organization. And to do that, I want to start with the history of you two. Uh, Michael just said that you've been <laughs> friends for 28 years, but I want to know what drew you to the theater? What was it about theater that drew both of you to it? Was it a certain performance? Was it a certain song? What was it about theater and uh, like performing that drew you? So we'll start off with Michael because we started off with Garrett on the last question. We'll rotate back and forth here. But Michael, what was your what was your foyer into theater? The earliest, earliest, earliest theater experience that I can remember. I don't know if you even remember this, Garrett. You and I, our mothers took us to, it's Hadley Wazern School District. They did, I want to say it's, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory or Willy Wonka and the Chocolate, it was, it was not even like a musical, it was just a play. They did that, My, our parents took us to that because our mothers are very good friends. And just, I fell in love with it. Just the idea of going on stage, of getting to put on this show, of getting to be someone else. And really, I was not, an, I was not athletic. I'm gonna be the first one to admit that. And this was a way to kind of get involved and do something extracurricular that wasn't necessarily kicking or throwing a ball around. And I was dancing and I enjoyed singing. And then my first show I ever did, I was in the high school production of MAME where I played young Patrick Dennis. And it was just life-changing getting to be a part of it. It was a way to make friends that I related to, that I had quirky, weird sort of thoughts that matched my quirky, weird kind of thoughts. And it was just such a, a wonderful community, a super accepting and diverse community to be a part of too. You don't always necessarily see that welcomed a little homosexual boy in with open arms. Now, what about yourself, Garrett? What was your first introduction? I'm assuming you're going to say the exact same thing Michael said about the first introduction. So we'll expand the question a little bit and say, why was theater such a big part of your growing up that you sort of start wanted to create an organization like the Bunbury Players? Well, I think I have an earlier experience remembering in the theater, at least I'm told. Um, going to a touring production of uh, Kathy Rigby and Peter Pan and um, my grandparents taking me and they remember me asking questions about the technical elements. So, you know, from the beginning, I was going to be a director. Um, <laughs> what little kids usually would ask about, you know, who the characters were. No, I wanted to know why specifically they were wearing that costume and such. Um, <laughs> also, I, uh, early um, memory of theater was my parents, you know, listening to cast recordings in the car. Um, I remember there's Cats, um, uh, Joseph, the amazing tech, Technicolor Dreamcoat with Donny Osmond. And... Um, rent Disc 2. <laughs> yes. Because we got Rent Disc 2, skipping over contact. Yeah, um, so... I I remember Rent. Rent actually ended up being the first show I ever directed. But as a kid with Rent, I think they always put the CD on shuffle. So I had no idea what the story was and probably was for the best at five years old. We, we, we talk about your past. We talk about uh, the introduction. 
um, I, I, I know for, from my experience, and I just, I, I just want to let the people know who are listening to this, why I'm talking about history is because um, I, I find it fascinating, the lead up to how something is created. And I find that uh, when a passion, like uh, I had passions as a kid, and I can tell you, I have none of those passions now. Why have you stayed <laughs> with it so long? What is it about theater? Because you talk about your introduction, you talk about that, but there has to be that moment when you said, this is what I could do. What was that moment for you that you said, you know what? I could potentially be a director. I could be acting. I could be doing this. What was it about the theater that kept drawing you back? So Garrett, to, to continue the rotation, you're up first, dude. <laughs> I always joke and I say, well, the reason why I always stuck with theater is because I couldn't do anything else. And it, it's, it's, <laughs> you know partially what? Facts. Facts. <laughs> it's partially true. It's partially true. But I think I, I I obtain I'm very much someone who likes to obtain knowledge so when I get situation uh, fascinated on something the it, it keeps growing and expanding to to a point where you know it's it becomes my life <laughs> so that's one thing with the theater is you know it's I'm someone who I, I want to keep expanding my knowledge on a topic so I you now, know I just couldn't help it you know <laughs> now was it always artistic directing that you want to do because uh for those who don't know and there's probably a lot of people who are listening to this right now going what the hell is an artistic director because I'm thinking you're the person who paints the sets and that's it what is an artistic director and why was that an important choice for you to do in the Bunbury players so an artistic director it, it could mean quite a different uh, quite a lot of different things depending on the organization generally so what does it it's mean someone in the, in the realm of the bunbury players <laughs> right generally it's someone who is responsible primarily for overseeing each show to making sure it's its highest quality in terms of producing in terms of you know planning a season in terms of you know obtaining the, director. the directors yeah, uh, uh, often an artistic director will direct one or two shows in the season um, but it, it's pretty much just making sure the each show is at its highest quality as, that it can be now Michael for yourself uh, you've been just recently appointed to this position or elected to this position sure, yeah. of interim executive director um, what is your roles and responsibilities in the Bunbury players? Sure. So my role and responsibility almost is where Garrett's the behind the scenes, getting all that nitty gritty working together. I'm almost like the face of the organization. So I'm going out there trying to book interviews like this to get our name out there. I'm helping with fundraising. I'm helping with development of the program, growing it helping lead our meetings, helping um, make sure that all of that front facing stuff helps us to have the best possible outcome, whether that's getting people into our doors to see our show, getting donations to our company, getting uh, kind of doing outsourcing to communities where there's people that want to get involved in theater, but don't know how. So almost that like in front of the scenes, whereas Garrett's doing all that behind the scenes work to make sure that we're running as a smooth machine and getting the best, highest quality kind of productions and, and company and, and season that we can get. Now, for those who have listened to the, uh, the crossboard interviews with Chris Brown before, you know that Michael has done productions in the past where he was an actor. Uh, he talked about one of them openly uh, back in November, back in October and September and August, uh, The Diary of Anne Frank, if I'm not mistaken, it was called. But sure was. This wasn't the very first production. Um, we're going to talk about that after the commercial break here, but I, I want to end on this before we go into some of the productions is Bunbury Players. W why that name? What's in the name? Garrett, Michael, who wants to take the the reason why it was called the Bunbury Players? Uh, I'll take it because I'm the one who named it. Um, there you yep. go. <laughs> uh, 
So it all goes back to our initial production, which was the, um, I was going to say the diagram, right? Uh, the importance of being earnest, <laughs> um, which there is a character who pretends to have a friend off in the country named Mr. Bunbury. It's a way for him to escape from everyday problems, not have to deal with family members he doesn't want to deal with. So in a way, it's a persona in terms of, um, it's a persona who likes to have a little bit of fun and cause a lot of mischief. So in a way, that's who we are. We like to put on personas, have a lot of fun, and maybe cause a lot of mischief too. So like, I'm going to follow up with that because I think it's an important question to ask because in, especially in today's age with COVID-19, with the pandemic, with everything the way it is, with the situation going on in Ukraine and Russia, you talk about how in the importance of being earnest, it was uh, the character's escapism about escaping reality, escaping life, escaping family. Is that what theater is to you? Is that what theater can be for those people who are having issues? Because there are so many troubles in this world today. We all need that outlet where we can just go and escape reality for an hour to two hours. So is that what theater is? And is that sort of a subtle uh, nod to the people who might be coming to see a show of yours to say, come and just escape reality and just sit and enjoy yourself for an hour or so? Well, not necessarily. Um, we've done shows like the Diary of Anne Frank, which deal with, you know, important historical events and social issues. But um, in a way, theater from the very beginning it was kind of a, a form of escapism by also subtly putting in um, some real life issues in there. Um, so theater can, the best thing you can do for an audience is to not let them know that they're learning something and then they're, <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. And that they are having to deal with actual problems in the world. Um, if you look at the, well, the importance of being here, this is not a great example um, because it is all about, well, that's not true. It's about <laughs> rich white people who have absolutely trivial problems. And that's yep. why, and it's supposed to kind of show you that there's this class of people who can, you think they've got their problems where they're really escaping from the real problems in the world. Um, that's one way of putting it. So, what about yourself, Michael? Do you have anything to follow up on that before we take a commercial break here? Uh, uh, absolutely. I think, especially when you look at sort of the more historical plays, uh, it's a great way to teach people things that they didn't necessarily know. I mean, the number of people that came up to me after the diary, the diary of Anne Frank, and said, "I didn't realize there were other people in the attic with her." Or, it, or that it wasn't necessarily an attic. It was a whole, it was a two-story like little house that they were in. Um, and a lot of, a, a lot of people got a chance to learn that. And even seeing some of the musicals that I've seen, I just saw, and not the same, not the same level of story, but uh, the Gloria Estefan musical, On Your Feet, there were people, because everyone knows Gloria Stefan got, um, her tour bus was hit by a, by a truck on her way to Glens Falls, New York <laughs> uh, for a concert and she lost the ability to walk. Seeing that in the, the theater when that happened, people were gasping like, wait, that happened. You heard someone go, that happened? Like, it's a way to, yes, it happened. I don't know. <laughs> in Glens Falls, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and it was Glens, like, it's a way to teach people about things. And like, Anne Frank is one, like, very one side of the example, whereas the Gloria Stefan musical is very much the other about a Latin singer, but it's a way that people can learn. And there's so many historical plays and historical musicals um, 
there is in fact a Diary of Anne Frank musical that is atrocious and should not have been made, but like it's a way to connect people to history. Uh, 1776, another great example, teaching people history of the uh, American Revolution and the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Alexander Hamilton? I, I guess that counts too if we want to. I don't necessarily love that musical, but because I don't like Lynn Manuel Miranda. No. <laughs> I appreciate you being honest about that. So we're going to take a quick break here and then we'll be back to just talk about sort of the productions and what what spawned the idea of giving uh, the productions for free to people who want to see it. So we'll be back right after this quick break. Come celebrate Calgary's favorite cocktail. Calgary Caesar Fest is taking place on May 19th and 20th right here in the birthplace of Canada's official national cocktail. As listeners and viewers of the cross-border interviews with Chris Brown, you will receive 20% off your tickets when you use the promo code CBI Caesars. That's C-B-I Caesars, all one word. Just visit CalgaryCaesarFest.com and get your tickets today. Welcome back. Uh, another great episode, uh, another great edition, another great uh, commercial break there. And we love we, that commercial. What a great commercial. That <laughs> great that great commercial that we do not know what it was because I have not planned it out this far in advance, but great commercial. Um, <laughs> we are going to talk about the lead up to that very first production of In the Importance of Being Earnest. Um, uh, we'll start with Garrett on this one because as the founder of the organization, co-founder of the organization. I'm not sure how many other people were involved with you during that buildup, but I want to know the, the, the mission statement of the organization was to sort of give free access to the theater. Why was that important to you when you first set out to start this one, potentially one-time production of uh, one theater production and not make it a reoccurring thing? Well, I remember at the, the same time we were doing our, the importance of being earnest online, there was another show or a couple other shows online and they were actually charging admission um, for people to watch the show. I was actually a part of one, but that will re uh, stay nameless. Um, Name it, name it. Ask the hard questions, Chris. Name it, name it. Yes. Joking, go ahead. Um, <laughs> um, and <laughs> they had a lot more rehearsal time and a lot worse quality product and they were charging people. So um, at first so it was, well, we, we really should not charge people to begin with to see a Zoom production. And also... We thought, well, that will also make it easier for people to see if the shows continue to be filmed. Um, and we, I began thinking more, you know, during this pandemic time, it's hard for people to afford theater. And I was just thinking more and more about the crazy ticket prices of, of shows, you know, even on Broadway, uh, ridiculous ticket prices does not match inflation to what it used to be. But that's beside the point. And I just know it was hard for people to go see theater and to be a part of theater without having to, you know, without it costing an arm and a leg. So I really wanted people to be able to see theater and experience theater at no cost. And, you know, if they felt like putting in a donation to help us continue on, that was all great and everything, but that wasn't our main objective. Our main objective was to be able to let people see all the theater they we had to offer without having to spend any money. Well, I, I appreciate that because the fall, the initial follow up to that is things don't things aren't free in this world. Let's be honest. I know, Production I know. time, uh, creating sets artistic directing rental of halls just 
things don't cost, uh, things aren't free. As much as we want them to be, they don't. So when uh, you were doing the importance of being earnest, you must have seen an uptick of potential like uh, expenses. And if you're giving it away for free, like the business model to me doesn't make sense. And I just want to know from your perspective, how did you make sure that what was coming in was matching what was going out? Because if nothing's coming in, you don't have anything to go out. So if donations are $50, you have a $50 production. So just talk me through that process of making sure donations and potential costs don't exceed what we could potentially have because you want to put on the best performance. And it seems like a great uh, uh, theory of giving uh, production away for free, but how do you do that in a realistic manner? Well, our first two productions, actually, we did not ask for donations. Um, however, all our performers, because uh, they're on Zoom, all of our performers and all of our tech crew, um, they're all volunteers and they're all people who really believe in the mission statement in doing so. Um, we also have great relationships with other theaters who are very are very generous and have loaned us costumes and have loaned us set pieces and props. And um, honestly, if we didn't have those connections working with those other theaters, we wouldn't be anywhere. Um, in terms of, you know, the donations, we've had some great donors, luckily. Um, and, you know, we're very, we try to stick to a budget pretty closely. And really tried to think, all right, let's, you know, you think of the mega musical like Phantom of the Opera or something that really rely on giant sets and really, and lots of costumes. We try to focus our productions on really making sure people aren't just looking at the sets and costumes, but really focusing on the actors, however, giving them the technical giving them the technical things that look good, but at the same time, don't have to be giant and, you know, distracting. So when you're looking at a potential production, like that, that first start off, right? The importance of being earnest. Was, was your heart set on doing the importance of being earnest for the first piece? I'm assuming as it's in public domain, it's free to use. You don't have to pay a setup fee to potentially do that. So was that like the initial goal is, okay, how do we keep our costs low? So let's look at the public domains and let's look. Or because of the Bunbury players and you already had that sort of name, I think, in mind, was it sort of just a, a like a great segue to say, okay, this is a great name, so let's do the importance of being earnest? Or did you say, let's the importance of being earnest and well, this is a great uh, name for the organization because of the production we're doing? The, the play came first and then the name. Um, <laughs> We definitely chose the play because it was in the public domain. The next play we did after that is uh, Shaw's Pygmalion, which was also in the public domain. We love a free show. <laughs> and then our third production was a cabaret of, of a bunch of show tunes. And the venue we were at has a blanket license with BMI and ASCAP. So which we were is, able to perform sorry, whatever songs BMI we want. BMI-S cap, sorry, I don't know. Just, yeah, uh, not body mass index. Um, oh, okay, but that's what I'm thinking. I'm like, why would that be important for a production? Like, that just doesn't make sense. So what does that mean in the theater realm? Because if I'm asking the question, someone else is going to be asking the question. It's my show, and I'm just asking the questions here. That's all right. Uh, so BMI and... Um, cannot tell you what BMI stands for. I have no, it's something with the music industry. But just and generally uh, what ASCAP, does it mean? it's I, do, I don't know what the but overall what they are, they're two um, they're two licensors of music. So um, so they pretty much hold the rights for these, these So it's writers. like a record company. In a way, yes. But okay. it's publishing, music publishing. Uh, okay sorry i just wanted to make yes. sure because if like i said i just want to make sure i'm asking the questions that my listeners would no 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 that's as well i get that question a lot what what the <laughs> hell is bmi 
And I feel like someone is about to give us the answer here in about two seconds when, because I see movement on his video screen of him looking up something on the internet right now. Listen, you know, we love a immediate in the moment <laughs> fact check. Um, I cannot get what the actual like acronyms are. But it's just, are. It's, a, it's a company though. It's just a company. It's that- two different, it's two distinct companies. Oh, okay. Uh, here, Broadcast Music Inc. And ASCAP stands for? Let, I think it be it's the Association ASCAP. of uh, Composers and Publishers. Yep. So doing public domain uh, shows is quite interesting because it does open up a lot of uh, avenues where you can go because... For those who might not know that the public domain uh, laws in the United States after 100 years of, if I'm not mistaken, the first production or of the author's death or publisher's death, then it becomes public domain. So it gives you a lot of leeway into some of those great productions that we sort of grew up with, not like the ones like from the 80s, but ones from like the 20s, like... uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of age myself here on what my musical taste is and my theater's taste is, but these sort of Gilbert and Sullivan's, like those were what I grew mm-hmm. up with and those were, is what yeah. I love. Like, come on, Three Little Maids or Milk Are We? Like, come on, if I can't be singing <laughs> that every five minutes and you're not doing a good job. So going forward, after that very first production of uh, The uh, Importance of Being Earnest, did you automatically think to yourself, we, we did a good job? It was via Zoom. Might not have been the most uh, uh, theater production-wise greatest performance, but hey, it's our first attempt at doing something different that's not on an actual stage and it's via Zoom. Was there a moment when you said, let's try it again? Or did you already have it planned out after you started doing that first one? We're going to do a second one. We're going to do a third one. Or was it audience feedback that you got just take me through the process of how a one production show became the organization that is today it was kind of a spur of the moment definitely i did not have a, another show planned um it was by the time we were done with Ernest. Uh, I think it was really the feedback with the cast um, more than anything, because we we really enjoyed performing with each other. Initially, it was just a a core group of like 10 people um, who were available. (laughs) That was, that was the main thing. Um, So I, we really enjoyed our company. So we said, well, let's do this again. Um, So initially the idea of creating a group wasn't really not until i think we were about halfway through our second production we're like okay we should really focus on this mission and making it a a regular thing now i just want to make sure that we bring in our other guest in here as well just to add him oh yes conversation but i want to ask the question to you michael because uh while we we all know that you were uh, a certain player in a diary of Anne frank I want to know when when did you get introduced into the organization of the Bunbury Players? Well, Diary of Anne Frank was my first show with the organization. It was the it was a call that I received of, hey, we're doing this show. Um, we have an open slot. Can you come be a part of it for this role? And I had just freshly moved back. Uh, I did not have much time to do auditions at that point. I had just started a new job. So I said, sure, I'll come. It's it's, it was not like aggressive commitment of like 800 months and like five, five rehearsals for 800 months. It was a good six weeks and in and out. So I figured why not get involved, become a part of it. I watched Ernest, ha- Ernest happen on Zoom from LA. I watched some of Pygmalion. And so I'd already kind of been very aware of the existence of it and of the productions going on. And it just seemed like a really great opportunity to get back involved with theater after having taken almost a six or seven year break from it. 
We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. I want to know about the uh, the production value of doing a show via Zoom compared to doing one via the stage. Because I can imagine that first few sets of productions that you did with the importance of being earnest, the cabaret and insert random second production that I wrote down, but I cannot find on my notes because I have sloppy handwriting. Um, hey, Pagmalion. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, those first three productions, wh wh where the first two were via Zoom, would have been a little bit harder to do as the artistic director of the organization because it, it's a complete new entity on itself of adding Zoom as kind of a new character into a production. Uh, Zoom was definitely a trial and error. Um, at the, I really had never used Zoom before, so I had really no idea how it worked someone showed me and i'm like oh i think we can do something with this um <laughs> it goes back to um actually i had done a mock test with it back so the production was in october in may i tried to do a mock test with it by grabbing a bunch of people and trying to get them to read the star wars screenplay for the fourth <laughs> um pass <laughs> yes! Gary, you just became so, the new best friend <laughs> so i'm like well let's it, that that didn't work let's just i couldn't even get zoom to work on that so i had no idea what i was doing um however i'm like well let's try it again let's try something that's you know with rehearsal time and so I, I'm like, it helps if I pay for Zoom too. Then we could get unlimited hours to put the show on. Um, but I had to explore some cinema techniques in terms of, you know, let's, whenever someone exited, I'm like, okay, we're going to turn your video off here. Um, we're going to turn your video back on. Let's try adding some filters. Let's try. So it was really trial and error and just trying to, myself figuring it out with the cast and luckily some of them are a little bit more technically savvy than i am um so it helped um and honestly it it wasn't that far different from actual theater it was just knowing knowing what the right bush buttons were to push um we we talk about that first few productions but this organization isn't just those first few productions. You've had an amazing first full year of 2021 because I think if I'm not mistaken, you started late or like mid to late 2020 well, when the pandemic hit with that first uh, show. Then you had all of 2021 and we are now in a new year and we're now moving forward. You, We are seeing the rise of restrictions and mandates across America, across Canada where shows can start being put on in studio. And this question might be for Michael here or Garrett if whatever one wants to take it, but what does 2022 hold for the uh, Bunbury players? Because you now have a new other entity to start dealing with is health restrictions, making sure people are safe when they go to the uh, theater. So what are what is the Bunbury players putting in place so that way people feel safe going to the productions? Sure, I'd love to take this actually. Um, so something we're trying to do is every single person who is a member of our cast needs to present their vaccination card to us. You have to be vaccinated if you wanna play with us. That's just bottom line where we're going with it. And then to come see the shows, we are encour not encouraging, we are mandating masks during the performance. We are mandating even to some degree as rise as cases are rising, if we see an uptick where the number of cases is very extreme or it does start to tick in a higher per day kind of situation, we are going to mandate vaccines to come and see our production. I know that's something right now we are talking about doing for an upcoming show we're trying to get on 
get going. But in order to be safe and make sure everyone involved is safe, that is a vaccines mandated for all cast members, masks mandated for all members of the community to come see our show. And even to some points, if the number of cases per day is very high, we are mandating masks in the middle of rehearsals. We also have a very strict guideline for our uh, quarantining. If a member of the cast does become uh, or does test positive or does start to show symptoms, we do mobilize really quickly with getting that information out along with um, checking in, making sure tests come back negative before they can come back. The beauty with Zoom, we can have someone on Zoom and walk them around with where they're gonna be if we need to do that for the production, which during Diary of Anne Frank, we had to do a couple of times because we had a few teachers that would get pulled all of a sudden because a student tested positive. It's, it happens and we are taking the pandemic as seriously as we should be while still trying to put on these productions because this is this is important to us and this is something we do enjoy doing and the community is uh, actively coming to see us and we just want everyone to be safe. I, I, I love the word safe and I appreciate that people are trying to still, while restrictions are being lifted, people are still trying to keep people safe. Um, let's talk about the upcoming season because I do know that you do have a few productions that are going to be coming out here soon. Uh, I know that uh, I'm not sure as the new inter uh, interim uh, executive director, you can talk about what can people expect coming up and then we'll start doing our wrap up here because we're almost at that hour mark, but I just want to make sure that we get into what what's coming. You and I got to finish in an hour. This is this is groundbreaking. Everyone listening, put this on the books. This is not a three hour conversation. Uh, <laughs> so we can't talk too much about what's coming, coming just because licensing rights, we still haven't gotten them, even though we are looking at some public domain work. We still want to make sure we have streaming rights, because if you go to Bunbury Players on YouTube, you can actually watch a majority of our productions. And we want to continue being able to provide that to our listeners, viewers, uh, people involved with theater that want to see these productions. We want them to be able to see that even if they're not necessarily in the theater with us, because some people just don't feel comfortable yet to come to theater, but want to still actively see it. Um, I know we do, however, have auditions coming up for It's a Flop. We're going to be doing a cabaret based on flops, which I love a good flop. I don't know if you're super familiar with it, Garrett or Chris, but Garrett can definitely explain that to us because this is his kind of project right now. So it's a flop. What is this all about? Because I, 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 I'm just going to be real here. I, I don't see a lot of theaters and I, I would assume if you go to Broadway, you're automatically a, a smash hit. Like the old... Uh, uh, Mel Brooks TV uh, movie, The Producer said, if you put it on air, people will come and watch it because Springtime with Hitler was a massive success. So I can imagine there's no flops in Broadway, is there? Uh, there are much, <laughs> many more flops than there are hits. Yes. Really? Um, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, everyone thinks there can be a writer and yeah, that's the that's both the problem and the beauty of theater is <laughs> but if you have enough money you can put on anything you want doesn't mean it'll run but you can put on whatever you want um so the definition of a flop it it, it differs however the definition we were using are um short-lived shows so less than 250 performances um, that's a flop according to you that's like a that, flop. that to me would be like a massive success no you don't you normally would... make back your money so think about it this way there's eight shows a week um how many yeah adds up really fast doesn't it not even a year yep. wow okay uh usually about six months is about so can you yeah. tell can you tell some of my the viewers and listeners what like what are productions that are considered in your terms a flop that they would be potentially seeing in this production the cabaret production of it's a flop so i always use the definition of the musical adaptation of stephen king's novel carrie um they thought it it was so bad <laughs> 
I, the story I always tell is um, the director was from the Royal Shakespeare Company. And when they brought in a producer, they said, you need to tone it down and make it more like Grease. And they meant Grease, the musical, but the director thought they meant Ancient Grease. Um, and so everybody was in white togas the entire show. Okay. So, yeah. And um, so... What, why is this why is this a up, upcoming show like uh, i can imagine that sometimes you like poking fun at yourself and as per theater productions you because you see the rise of the like uh like i forget what it's called but there's movies where they put on uh, theater productions and everything goes wrong oh. what could go wrong goes wrong it's one of those like the set falls apart the doors don't close yeah. and all that like is that just making fun of theater because i feel like sometimes you just want to have fun or is this like an actual here are some of the biggest flops that we have seen in production history and boy god you're gonna get a good show because there are some bad ones out there i could just imagine carrie and togas <sighs> well <laughs> the thing is we will be telling the stories of these shows but the main thing is to highlight what was positive about the shows and oftentimes yeah. it's the it's song music. The music is some of the shows have the best music. The play didn't work for whatever reason. Maybe there was an issue with the script or it was too ambitious. Um, the original, I want to say the original Color Purple is considered a flop because it didn't run very long and because it was considered too ambitious, but the revival won the Tony. I mean, it's sometimes it's a show that has gorgeous music and, and a gorgeous story or a problematic story and an ambitious set. and. Like with Carrie, Carrie has seen a lot of success in high schools as a show and as a production, but just they did it how you should have done it with like Lots more like right. Grease the musical and not Grease the country. <laughs> okay. Musical, a show I'm in right now is considered a flop. It's a collection of Dr. Seuss shows and it's considered a, a, a flop. It was only on Broadway for, I want to say like 160 days. Um, performances <laughs> yeah 160 performances sorry uh, Little Women's considered a flop it was only on Broadway for like 94 performances and I know Little Women's a show everybody knows because Sutton Foster was in it and I believe she even won the Tony for it but it was a flop I, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna interject here for a second because Garrett you've just done something on this show that no one else has been able to do but you corrected Michael Nichols Pate on the fly. So thank you so much for that because anyone who's listening- Go to fuck show, yourself. <laughs> Go fuck yourself. Um, thank you. Um, let's talk about the Bunbury players again. Uh, let's talk about the mission statement about giving back and giving to the community and giving away productions for free. We, we live in a world where not a lot of things come by free. Not a lot of things, like I've said in the past, aren't easily accessible. Giving back, what do you hear from people who attend your performances, who, pre uh, pretend, uh, who attend your productions, sorry? What are you hearing from them about that, that, that small generosity of giving something that takes time, effort, resources back to the community and for free it's all been positive yeah. um i haven't heard a negative thing um I, the, often i hear this is something that needs to be done and this is some these are shows that people need to see these will allow people who cannot afford to see shows who you might have someone who's the next Broadway star who they got the chance to see a show because in an environment when they never would have. Um, and that's what we really hope is to, to create a, a new generation of, of theater lovers and theater artists and give everyone the the ability to experience such such great art form 
Um, I'm not going to try and rip off uh, rip off a show, but um, what would you what would you have given to like if you were a young kid right now? What would you have given to see a show like the ones you put on? for free as a kid as a high school student as someone who wanted to get into the theater uh production side of things for a job for a career what would you have given because i can imagine there are kids out there right now who are like i i, I love the music i love sitting in the back of my car listening to my parents play rent the album the cast recording cats what would you have given to have seen a production, a community theater production of a show as a kid? I think that's kind of tough for me specifically to answer just because I growing up was always able to afford something like mm. that. So the question to me, it's like, well, that would never have been my story. So when I'm now, especially doing social work, looking at things from families that can't, that have kids that really do, it, it means the world to say, you know, I don't have to find 10, 20, 30, $40 for you to go see a show. I don't have to find 50, 60, $70 for you to be a part of a show. You can just go audition, be a part of it. You can just go see the show, be inspired. It's a, it, it, to me, like, as someone who had that privilege and was able to grow up and not have to worry about that, it's not affecting me that much. But as someone who now does that, it's just, like I said, it means the world to families that are able to come and now be a part of a community that can be very gatekeeping. And I, I had the same experience as Michael growing up. We had enough money to go see shows. However, I had a lot of friends who didn't. I had a lot of friends who couldn't be a part of shows with me. A lot of friends who couldn't go see shows with me. And, you know, it was, it it didn't feel right that why should I get this experience and not everyone else? Yeah. We've talked about the health restrictions being lifted, mandates being lifted. And this is kind of the last segment I want to talk about here is the return to Broadway, the return to live in productions. Um, there's nothing like sitting in a, a theater, an amphitheater, uh, and watching something live in person. But over the last two years, you, we've seen more and more people want to stay back because of health restrictions, because of COVID-19. During your productions that you've been putting on where they have been in person, are you seeing people excited to come back to the theater, excited to get out and actually be with a group again because there's that sense of uh, group or family when you're in a theater watching a group of people put on a show like that. So the productions that you have been doing in person, are you seeing an overwhelming response to people wanting to come out because they're kind of, and I don't want to use a bad word here, but sick and tired of the COVID lifestyle, the Zoom lifestyle and are happy to go out and actually see something live in person i mean absolutely um people who definitely want to see theater live and you know i we try to create a safe environment for everyone where they they always have i've we haven't had any complaints in, in our shows that they feel like you know that they're they're sitting too close because we properly socially distance our audience members we have them wear a mask we make sure they present their vaccination cards we make sure it's a safe environment so they can have the experience that they deserve to enjoy yeah i mean ditto <laughs> like, I, I it's a lot of i mean theater is fantastic and getting to see theater like there's something there's just such a different experience when you're in a space versus watching something on a screen whether that's through zoom whether that's through youtube and definitely i i know some people aren't ready to go in person so that's also why we're trying to keep our accessibility going by having it on our youtube channel bunbury players i but something so surreal about being in a theater in a moment, getting to see, see a performance happen live in front of you. Someone fucks their lineup. It's happening live in front of you. A 
person kind of comes into their own and kills a song so badly and it, or kills it and it's such a good positive and the room is ringing it's buzzing and you, you don't always get that from something like zoom that buzz and that feel of being in so there it's just a lot of really positive uh comments it's a lot of excitement about being back in the theater and even from the the backstage the sheer number of people we get that want to be involved in some way whether that's technical or on stage or building sets or doing makeup or costumes or, 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 or like we have so many people that just want to return to theater and keep coming back to this organization. When I was doing Diary of Anne Frank, even through all the frustrations, people were like, I'm just so happy to be in, involved with this. And I, I just want to keep getting invited back to do these things because this is such a amazing community. And, and, especially when you're offering free theater, it's just not seen. So it's stuff that people, people want to be a part of it. Um, I, I said it was going to be my last segment uh, talking about that, but there is one last thing that I forgot to mention. And of course we would have to try and make this longer than an hour. So Michael Nichols pay can be proven wrong twice in an interview, but <laughs> you're rude. Um, Organizations like yourself that rely so heavily on donors, that have, rely heavily on volunteers, that rely heavily on uh, a lot of other issues, uh, a lot of other uh, uh, entities. Um, how can people help? How can people get involved? How can people learn more about the organization? Because we have talked for just under an hour, and I just want to extend this past the hour mark. Um, but how can people learn more about your organization? Is there websites, uh, Facebook pages? Is there email addresses that they can reach out to? Absolutely. So bunburyplayers.weebly.com is our actual website where you can get uh, information regarding our shows. You can get information regarding auditions to things. Um, you can find out information regarding the directors, committee chair people, what our season is, past productions, all that kind of stuff is on our website. And we also have a gorgeous little button. Her name is Donate. We love donations. We kind of need it as a, like you said, theater is expensive. Rights to shows can be expensive. Yes, doing public domain is great, but a lot of the musicals, a lot of the productions that we all kind of want to see be a part of, things like that, eventually we do want to do things like musicals. We'd love to do things that have rights that we would have to pay for, sets that we would have to pay for, costumes, props. It, it does add up. And so we do re rely solely on donations. So anyone that has got a little bit of change in their pocket that wants to donate, we don't want to shy anyone away. Um, we love donations from people, especially from community members, both locally and globally. Um, before I let you both go, I want to thank you both for doing this. This has been enlightening. Uh, I know that your organization is one of the good ones out there because I know for someone who had a, who didn't have a uh, theater background, I would have killed to have gone to see a theater for free uh, in my local uh, community as a kid, because I can imagine that there are kids out there right now who want to get involved, who want to learn about the theater, who enjoy musicals. And when an organization like yourself comes around, and they give back in the way that you guys do, it doesn't just benefit uh, the people in your community, but extends out from that. And I appreciate what you guys do because even influencing one person makes a massive difference in your life. So um, from, uh, from Calgary, Alberta uh, to upstate New York, I wanna, I wanna thank you for doing what you guys have done over the last year and a half and continue to do, because I know that this is not something that is just going to end after the pandemic ends and it's gonna continue on. So I, I, I give you guys credence and I said this before and I'll say it again, uh, there will be a donation from Miranda Brown Associates Incorporated, the company, our company, our parent company at Cross Board Interviews with Chris Brown, uh, coming to the Bunbury Players to ensure that this organization continues to live on in uh, its infamy because I think you guys do a great service to your community. And I hope other organizations out there and other community groups out there 
listen to this interview and realize that sometimes giving away free stuff does actually make a difference in one person's life. So continue to do that. So Garrett, Michael, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Um, so everyone here at the Crossword Interviews with Chris Brown, um, actually, before I uh, leave, I should say uh, the links to the show note in the show notes, the Facebook page, the website, uh, the, the donate, Instagram, the YouTube, the Instagram are all in the show notes. So scroll down if you're watching this on YouTube. Uh, if you're watching, if you're if you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, yes, we're still on Spotify. Um, uh, anywhere other podcasts are found. Scroll back and you can find the information. So uh, for everyone here at the Crossboard Interviews with Chris Brown, have yourself an excellent rest of your day. And remember, have a conversation. Get out from behind Twitter, Instagram, social media, as I just told you to go there, but get out from behind there and have a conversation with somebody because at the end of the day, our world is better because we have actual face-to-face conversations. So have yourself an excellent day, guys. (music) 